Hello, my name is Phil Pereira, and I'm the Emergency Ultrasound Coordinator at the New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, and welcome to Soundbites Cases. In this module entitled Emergency OBGYN Ultrasound Part 1, we're going to focus entirely on the ultrasound findings of intrauterine pregnancy. Now, patients with early pregnancy and vaginal bleeding with or without abdominal pain are frequently seen in the emergency department. Luckily for us, emergency OBGYN ultrasound has evolved to be one of the most helpful applications of sonography in a busy emergency medicine practice. So this module will focus primarily on the detection of intrauterine pregnancy, and will examine the ultrasound findings that define a normal pregnancy for an emergency physician sonographer. Before launching into the sonographic findings of a normal intrauterine pregnancy, let's take a moment to quickly review the OBGYN anatomy important for this application. We see the uterus to the left and adnexa to the right. Notice the areas of the uterus. We see the lower cervix, the intermediate body, and the fundal region towards the top of the uterus. Now, the fundal region is where we define an intrauterine pregnancy to be located. We see the area where the fallopian tube enters into the uterus, which is the interstitial region in a normal uterus, and the corneal region in a bicornate uterus. And this is where some variants of ectopics can implant. Notice the areas of the fallopian tube to the right, which we'll concentrate more on with regard to ectopic pregnancy. And we see the broad limit ligament there encasing the fallopian tube and the ovary as seen to the right. When taking care of a patient who has vaginal bleeding in pregnancy, there's four main classifications of diagnoses. The first is a threatened abortion, which is defined as the presence of an intrauterine pregnancy with bleeding. The second main classification encompasses several different terms. The terms that are commonly used are incomplete abortion, missed abortion, blighted ovum, and fetal demise. Basically, all of these mean the presence of fetal membranes or parts without expected fetal growth or cardiac activity. The third main classification is a completed abortion in which there's no further presence of fetal membranes or parts, and on examination, usually the cervical os will be closed. And the fourth main classification is the most dangerous, is ectopic pregnancy. Here's a table showing the structures in pregnancy and about the time that they're seen on transvaginal versus transabdominal sonography. As we look in the embryonic structure column to the left, we see the first structure that appears as a gestational sac seen on transvaginal sonography at about 4.5 to 5 weeks and about a week later on transabdominal sonography. The yolk sac is seen at about 5 to 5.5 weeks on transvaginal sonography and a week later on transabdominal sonography. And I have this circled in red as this is really the way we diagnose an intrauterine pregnancy. Now note the fetal pole is seen at about 5.5 to 6 weeks on transvaginal sonography and a week later on transabdominal sonography. The last main finding, which is a fetal heartbeat, is seen at about 6 weeks on transvaginal sonography and about at 7 weeks on transabdominal sonography. Another important concept for OBGYN sonography is the correlation of the serum beta-HCG to the findings of a normal pregnancy. As we see here for transvaginal sonography, the discriminatory zone at which we will see findings of an intrauterine pregnancy are about 1,500 to 2,000 milli-international units. For transabdominal sonography, the discriminatory zone is about 6,500 milli-international units. Now, this rule does not apply to ectopic pregnancies, which secrete beta-HCG at atypical levels and are commonly seen with betas all over the map. They can be seen with betas lower than 1,000 and as high as 30,000. The first finding that will occur during an intrauterine pregnancy is going to be a gestational sac. And as we see here in the ultrasound picture to the right, it's a small round circle that's dark or hypoechoic in relation to the rest of the uterus. We actually see a gestational sac below that that came out of a patient. Notice that it has a translucent membrane type appearance. Unfortunately, gestational sac is not diagnostic of an intrauterine pregnancy as a pseudo gestational sac of ectopic pregnancy can be seen from hormonal stimulation. So as a general rule of emergency ultrasound is that visualization of gestational sac is not adequate to call an intrauterine pregnancy. Here's two video clips showing the gestational sac, long axis to the left and short axis to the right. We see here a very small diameter gestational sac in both of these orientations. Unfortunately, this can be seen with a pseudo gestational sac of ectopic pregnancy. So a small gestational sac like this is in no way diagnostic of an intrauterine pregnancy for the emergency physician sonographer. Remember that the gestational sac is seen at about 4.5 to 5 weeks on transvaginal sonography and about a week later on transabdominal sonography. 
Here are the findings that we define as indicative of an intrauterine pregnancy for an emergency physician sonographer, and that is the presence of a gestational sac with a yolk sac inside. And as we see in the picture to the right, the yolk sac has a circular type appearance that we call the positive Cheerio sign. Thus, just remember, gestational sac plus yolk sac is indicative of intrauterine pregnancy. However, bonus points are given if you see a fetal pole with a heartbeat for confirmation of intrauterine pregnancy. Here's a video clip showing a definitive intrauterine pregnancy. What we see here is a larger gestational sac, and as we look inside the gestational sac, we see the positive yolk sac or Cheerio sign. Notice the circular yolk sac is seen towards the inferior aspect of this gestational sac. So this would be diagnostic of an intrauterine pregnancy effectively ruling out an ectopic pregnancy in the vast majority of patients. Remember that the yolk sac is seen at about 5 to 5.5 weeks on transvaginal sonography and about a week later on transabdominal sonography. Here we see a pregnancy that is a bit further advanced. Note we have a larger gestational sac, that darker or hypochoic area within the fundal region of the uterus. And as we look inside the gestational sac, we see the positive yolk sac or the Cheerio. And looking just to the left of the yolk sac, we see a tiny little fetal pole there. Interestingly enough, as we zoomed up on that fetal pole, we could make out the flicker of a heartbeat. So a definitive intrauterine pregnancy. Recall that the fetal pole is seen at about 5.5 to 6 weeks on transvaginal sonography and about a week later on transabdominal sonography. Here's a transvaginal short axis view of a seven week intrauterine pregnancy. We see the gestational sac here. Notice that the gestational sac is located in the center of the uterus as seen here in short axis and there's a good amount of myometrial mantle surrounding the gestational sac signifying a fundal location. We see the positive Cheerio sign or yolk sac to the upper right aspect of the gestational sac and right below we see the fetal pole stretched out. Notice the positive cardiac activity as we scan back and forth through the fetal pole. Here's another intrauterine pregnancy at about seven weeks, again in a transvaginal short axis view. We note the good amount of uterus surrounding the gestational sac, signifying the fundal location. We see here the yolk sac or Cheerio sign and the fetal pole stretched out below the yolk sac. Notice the positive cardiac activity within the fetal pole. Now we see another very important finding here on this ultrasound, which is the amniotic membrane billowing out from around the fetal pole. Eventually the amniotic membrane will plaster down on the margins of the gestational fat sac to form the amniotic cavity in which further growth of the fetus will occur. Here's an interesting video clip showing a twin pregnancy. What we see here are two gestational sacs signifying dichorionic twins, and within each of the gestational sacs we can see little fetal poles with a flicker of heartbeats. Recall that fetal heart activity is seen at about six weeks on transvaginal sonography and about seven weeks on transabdominal sonography. Here's an early second trimester pregnancy. What we see here is the next Oscar de la Hoya. Note the mean right hook on the baby here. So the important finding here is that this is an intrauterine pregnancy as we can define a good mantle of uterus surrounding the pregnancy. And that's very important as there are some ectopics that can grow to an advanced age, but they're discerned by a lack of uterus around the pregnancy. Here's another second trimester baby, and as I work in northern Manhattan, I refer to this baby as the merengue baby, and note the baby moving around fluidly within the amniotic sac. A sure sign that this kid will grow up to be a slick dancer. So in conclusion, I'm glad I could share with you this Sound Bites module going over emergency OBGYN ultrasound part one of intrauterine pregnancy. Emergency OBGYN ultrasound is definitely one of the most helpful sonographic applications in a busy emergency medicine practice, and hopefully by going through the module, you now have an understanding of the ultrasound findings diagnostic of a normal pregnancy. I hope to see you back as we return in OBGYN ultrasound pregnancy part two, focusing on further assessment of normal pregnancy, as well as looking further into the ultrasound findings of an abnormal pregnancy.